Hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, live devotional series for the season of Advent. Uh, I'm Joel, our director of outreach here at Paris Presbyterian Church, and uh, I hope you've uh, found the stream okay, and I hope it's going to work. Uh, this is the first time we've tried it in this format, uh, so bear with us. Uh, if you want to leave a comment that you're here, that would be great. Uh, and that way we can see who's watching and uh, you can interact with our time of prayer and our reflection this morning. So as we begin, I'm going to uh, light the candle I have here as a reminder of God's presence in our time together. And I invite you, if you have a candle, where you are to do the same thing. As we begin our time of prayer this morning, uh, we're going to start off with a prayer and then uh, we'll go into a scripture reflection in a little bit. Uh, but as we start the time of prayer, I'm going to be reading um, prayers for Advent from Phyllis Tickle's uh, book, Christmas Tide, which is part of her uh, Divine Hours series. Uh, and so as we engage in this time of prayer, I'm going to invite you to respond at various points. I'll say, and the people respond, and uh, your response will be simple. Come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. And the people say, come, Lord Jesus. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. Happy are they all who fear the Lord and who follow in his ways. Come, Lord Jesus. Our reading this morning is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. And I'm going to be reading today from the New Revised Standard Version. That's Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you, you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us. You have delivered us into the hands of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. And all the people say, Come, Lord Jesus. Happy are they all who fear the Lord, who follow in his ways. And the people say, Come, Lord Jesus. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither, everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked, they are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, 
nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Happy are they who fear the Lord, who follow in his ways. Be Lord our helper and forsake us not. Do not despise us, O God, our Savior. And the people say, Come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Almighty God, give us all grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now and in the time of this mortal life which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Direct me, O Lord, in all my doings with your most gracious favor, and further me with your continual help, that in all my work begun, continued, and ended in you, I may glorify your holy name. And finally, by your mercy, obtain everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, uh, as I said earlier, our scripture today, and as I read earlier, our scripture today is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64. Uh, and we're going to come back around to Isaiah 64, uh, verses 1 through 9 in a second. But if you want to pull that out and, uh, you know, while I'm talking, you can kind of read along. Uh, but this is our reflection on Isaiah 64. And our theme for this first week, uh, our theme overall is ask, seek, and knock, uh, as Jesus tells us to do. And uh, so we're going to start off by saying ask. We're going to ask God for what we need. But well, we as human beings uh, tell time in a variety of ways. But no matter how you count it, this coronavirus pandemic and the associated changes in our routines has been going on for a long time. We all began this journey of necessity in mid-March with what was presented to us as a two-week shutdown to slow the spread. Yes, you can laugh at that now. It's funny. Now, eight months later, the spread is greater than at any point this year. And that's much more serious. Public health officials worry how Thanksgiving gathering may affect case numbers and hospital bed availability. The rest of us are wondering when a vaccine is going to be readily available um, to begin a new post-pandemic normalcy. We want a new normal. We want a normal beyond mask wearing, especially. And we're wondering together if the government might pass another relief bill. We're wondering if we would become infected. And if we do, how much suffering that would entail or how much that might put our loved ones at risk. But let's think in a different frame for our time together this morning. Let's think not in the secular day-to-day -day timeline of pandemic life, but let's enter the sacred timeline where God has been, where God is, and where God will always be with us. At the beginning of the pandemic in mid-March, we were in the third week of this season of Lent, and as we turned to the Bible as our companion to our journey, we found insight in the desert wanderings of the Israelites, and in Jesus' own time of testing in the wilderness. In some manner, our time in that place has continued as it did for the Israelites, who stayed in the desert far longer than intended, because they didn't learn their lesson. They didn't follow God completely. They didn't stick to righteousness and 
caring for each other, for their neighbor, and for God. Does that sound familiar? Well, over the past months of this pandemic, we have ventured in our Christian journey through our at-home testimonies to the resurrection at Easter. We've ventured into the hope and promise of Pentecost from our locked-in upper room. And through the weeks that we wondered, like a child on a long car ride, are we there yet? Now we are in this season that the church calls Advent, but I would suggest that we are not just in that season because the calendar says it is so. No, we are all truly in the season of Advent because we know what is already true and not yet realized. We are in a season as a people of anticipation. The season that is at the turning point of all history, the Advent turning point, is here. We are in the season of knowing that there are reliable vaccines on the horizon to unlock the doors of our seclusion. We're just not entirely sure when they will be available. And so now we count the days, waiting our best in the best we can in confident hope and faithful diligence. We are in the biblical narrative in the middle part of the library. We're in the middle part of the book. We are living no longer in the days of Moses leading God's people through the wilderness, but in the days of the prophets who spoke hope to trying circumstances. And so in parallel to our journey of self-examination in our Sunday worship services with Pastor Tina and our guest preachers, we are going to be considering now on these Wednesdays our place in this story, this story in the middle of Scripture, and the journey of God's people in that middle time. Hopefully this will serve to put even more context in what we have been thinking about in our Sunday services. We've all been digging under the surface of ourselves in order to receive our salvation. But all the while, all of us are also on a journey together as the church and along with the prophets of old. It is for this continual journey from desperate hope to realize joy that we turn now to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64. And I'll read from verses 1 through 3. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. Friends, the prophet is living in a time of unrealized expectations, not like our living in this eighth month of a two-week quarantine. Year after year, the prophet has called people to return to God in the hopes of the promise that God will restore them in their land. See, they've had all the promises of God before. They just didn't recognize it until it was gone. In the past, God had appeared on Mount Sinai to Moses. God has, had demonstrated power against the prophets of false idols by divinely igniting the bonfire of Elijah. God had even answered their yearnings for a king like the other nations. But as the people of God became more like the people around them, they forgot to turn to God and they turned elsewhere instead. And as a result, they lost everything. And now, 50 years since their exile, when we read this in Isaiah, since that hostile uh, takeover by a foreign, foreign power, there is hope on the horizon. They are now living under the rule of a more agreeable empire and king, one who is willing to restore their freedom to worship the God of Israel. And yet, it doesn't feel like it did before the captivity. God seems more distant than they remember him, even though they've returned to some sense of worship in the traditional ways even though they can, in some sense, rebuild their temple. We could all imagine all kinds of situations that would have been like those of Israel in the 530s before Christ. Perhaps it would be like if the United States, if we had lost the Cold War so spectacularly that the USSR had invaded our shores and made us into the United States of Soviet Russia. And then, after 50 years, 
under that foreign rule, the Soviet Union would have been co conquered by a more powerful nation whose leader was willing to restore a degree of autonomy to our shores. Could you imagine if we had lost the Cold War so spectacularly? If we lived under the rule of Russia? That would be kind of a situation like the Israelites experienced here. But also, we don't have to imagine such a situation because we're in a crisis of our own. We want to gather to praise God in one voice, but also we are prevented from doing that for good reason. And you know what? The ways that we are able to gather don't feel like the ways we remember, do they? The ways when God spoke to us in all of the feel-good ways that we remember, that we have great nostalgic memories for. And so now we, right now where we are, can take the message of Isaiah 64 to heart. Spend some time personally with this text. But I would like to suggest that here is the meat of what Isaiah is saying to us. Point one is this. Things in this world are not as they should be. There should be enough hospital beds and affordable health care for everyone who is sick. There is not. The world shouldn't be diseased at all. The very existence of biological viruses is a defect in the created order caused by the virus of sin. The thing is, we as the people of God know that there have been times when God has acted decisively to free and heal his people. God freed Israel from Egypt, God gave them a land of their own, and God sent Jesus Christ in the world to free us from our sins. And yet, right now God seems far removed from us. We have all at one point or another prayed a prayer of desperation to God, if only you would tear open the heavens and come down. If only you would heal me, or heal the one I love. The reality we begin with is this. We are experiencing a pandemic that is taking too many lives, and will take more. The reality is people suffer, and people die far too young, and we cry out to God, Come, Lord Jesus. So point one, things in this world are not as they should be. Point two, if you look to verses five through seven, is this. We cannot save ourselves. We as human beings are limited, and more than that, we are afflicted with the virus of sin. If anything has proven that to us, it's the past eight months. For all the good in the world that we have seen persevere through this pandemic, there is just as much, at least just as much, selfishness and evil. Right now, we all look for a cure, but a vaccine of the coronavirus is not a permanent cure. It's not a permanent cure for all that ails us. We thank God for the means to create, research, and manufacture a vaccine, but we need a savior beyond ourselves and our medical science. Because God knows that even our means of curing these bodily afflictions are just as fallible as everything else we do. And beyond that, a vaccine won't fix the sin of racism. It won't fix poverty. A vaccine won't fix hatred. It won't fix the sins of the brokenness of our communities. In fact, we're going to be tempted when this all is over to pretend like all is right with the world. We're going to pretend like we can return back to some old normal. We're going to pretend that this vaccine will have fixed everything because our pandemic will be over. The news flash is this. The world is diseased and we cannot save ourselves, even through science. All is not right with the world and it won't be by our own doing. The world is broken. The world is sick and this pandemic and its effects are only a symptom of this larger reality that we need salvation. And so point two, we cannot save ourselves. Point three is in verses eight and back to verse one. Healing comes decisively from outside ourselves. Friends, if we cannot save ourselves, then we have to rely on someone else to save us. 
There's a lot of candidates in this world for a savior, isn't there? Everyone is selling something that will supposedly cure what ails us. But the only one who can really fix the problem is one who is the master engineer who built the thing in the first place. The loving father who has watched us go astray. We need God to decisively act. As God acted in the past through Moses and all the prophets and then through Jesus. We need God to literally tear the heavens open and come down. The good thing that is, that is the very thing that God promises to do. We are told to cling tightly to Jesus because Jesus will come to free us in a decisive moment of power. Jesus will come to free us like the Allies freed the Nazi concentration camps. Jesus will come to heal us like a vaccine that inoculates us against a global pandemic. Jesus will come like a test that shows the cancer has disappeared. Jesus will come like a presidential pardon, freeing us from the prison to which we've become enslaved. And we don't even have to bribe God for that pardon. Jesus will tear open the fabric of our brokenness and enter into the core of our being. This is the hope and promise of Advent, the invigorating hope and promise of God acting decisively in Jesus Christ, it is not a hope to be rested in passively, my friends. It is a hope that wakes us up to how things are and leads us to prepare our hearts and minds for what is coming. It is a hope that raises a loud cry in our hearts, Come, Lord Jesus, make haste to help us. This desperate cry to God, this asking and even begging, is part of our faithful waiting. It's faithful because it reminds us about who God is and always has been. It reminds us that Jesus is the cure to our affliction. Not just the affliction of the pandemic, but our affliction of sin. But as we close this morning, many of us have already begged God for a long time. And we're likely to ask, how long must we wait? Well, the answer as it relates to COVID-19 is probably six months. If all goes according to schedule and the vaccine is accepted and trusted, we may be able to put COVID-19 behind us by early summer. That's what the news seems to suggest to me. That means we're over halfway through our waiting. We've come a long way, but there's still waiting to do. There's faithful waiting to do. The waiting that means we take every precaution for the good of our neighbors. The question, how long must we wait for God's deliverance, is a trickier one to answer. We do not know when God in Jesus Christ will once again rend the curtain of heaven and come down. What we do know for each of us is that God has torn open the curtain separating us from God in Jesus Christ. God has come and is here for all who ask, seek, knock, and receive. Today could be the day of salvation from the spiritual virus that afflicts you. But as it relates to the salvation of this whole world, we wait as those who have hope. We wait with loud cries out to God. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens, Lord, and come down. Just be prepared. That cry will go on for longer than six months more, but it also will come at an unexpected time. We might be able to un understand how God unexpectedly works in time through the character of Gandalf. Gandalf, or God, is a little bit like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, if you've seen the movies or read the books. Or, or rather, Gandalf embodies some of God's characteristics. In the Lord of the Rings movies, Gandalf is noted for saying, A wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. Gandalf says this about himself, but we would imagine that God would say such things about himself too. It will be thus that when God saves us, it will be at the precise moment and in the precise way that he intends for his glory and our good. God is never late, nor is he early. God arrives at the precise moment he intends. In the name of the God who holds the past, the present, and the future, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. 
Amen. Thanks for tuning in today, and we hope you'll join us next week at 11 o'clock for another devotional time together with prayer and reflection as we think on the theme, Seek. Um, if you're out there in the Paris area today, uh, you can stop by the gathering place at noon for your Wednesday warm-up. We've warmed up your soul, and now we hopefully can warm your bellies with a uh, free cup of hot soup to go. Uh, I hear them out there in the gathering place getting that ready as I speak. And now, go with this blessing. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May God guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May God bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.